Torah? Well, some people say philosophy and Christianity are contradictory, but today my guest, Richard G. Howe, who is Provost Professor of Philosophy and Apologetics in the Norman L. Geisler Chair of Christian Apologetics at Southern Evangelical Seminary, received his PhD from the University of Arkansas of Philosophy. He is coming on to argue that philosophy is not only important, but most imperative in our, to help us in our theology, our apologetics, and our everyday Christian walk. I'm super excited to have him on. Dr. How thank you so much for having me on. It's such a privilege. Oh, listen, great. My, my pleasure. Thanks so much. I look forward to this conversation. And of the everybody watching won't know but we had we were doing our recording and we had some major technical issues and Dr. Austin kind enough to help us get through that because that oh was, yeah no it's was, it's not a problem at all it was quite the situation so I'm so sorry about that thank you but um, Dr. Howe I really I feel like people need to hear this could you ex tell us your story how you got into philosophy what inspired you to get into philosophy how did you you eventually got your PhD in from the University of Arkansas, but what, what path did you take to get there? How did that all come about? Yes, so, you know, I, I was born and raised in the stereotypical phrase you hear, the Bible Belt. Uh, but despite that, I uh, wasn't raised in the church. I had a stable home, loving parents, great brothers, but I, I wasn't raised in the church. I didn't understand who Jesus was, my need for a savior. I always believed in the existence of God, which is kind of odd, in some respects, because I didn't have that input as a child. But through the influence of friends of mine in high school, I came to understand my need for a Savior, what Christ did for me, and I trusted Christ as my Savior. And now I'm tooling along as a high school student, trying to grow in the Lord. I was an old long-haired, well, I wasn't too long while I was in high school, but a uh, long-haired rock and roll drummer. This would have been the early 70s. And uh, go off to community college, what then were called junior colleges. I was a percussion minor, music, I'm sorry, percussion major, uh, um, which basically is a music major with my instrument being percussion. And I studied just enough music to tell people to annoy everyone around me. So I knew I didn't want to do that as a full bachelor's degree. And I was kind of floundering, like, I'm not sure where to go from here. And friends of mine said, you know, you can go off to senior college and study the Bible. Well, that's the most amazing thing. I, I didn't know there was a such thing. So I ended up going to our flagship denominational school in, in our state to major in Bible. And it was my first encounter with biblical skepticism, if you will. The campus environment was very nurturing for Christian life, except the religion department. It was very liberal. I didn't know what that meant. All these liberal theological things, JEPD or the documentary hypothesis or Deutero Isaiah, Jesus versus Paul studies, certainly didn't believe in the inerrancy and inspiration of the Bible as I thought everybody did. Mm -hmm. So I basically lost my faith in college. Now, I don't believe a Christian can lose his eternal life. Christians debate whether that's true or not. Uh, but pending that debate, I, I do believe there's a lot of things you can lose, including your confidence. And so God began to bring apologists into my life, names we would recognize, people like Josh McDowell, R.C. Sproul, uh, and most notably, Norm Geisler. And so they, they began to help me understand why I believed what I believe. That's what apologetics does, in effect. So before, I had a set of beliefs, but didn't really know why. Now I'm beginning to piece that together to understand why. And this is what began to give me my love for apologetics. It worked out having graduated college, I could go off and study at Dallas Theological Seminary under Norm Geisler. He was my hero, if you will, in apologetics. But th now we're talking the early 80s. And by this time, um, most seminaries, if they had anything in apologetics, were just one or two classes, including Dallas. It had an introduction to apologetics and then apologetic system, which is like different models, presuppositional, evidential, classical, those kind of things. But I take both of those classes and then it just isn't getting scratched. And I eventually just lost interest in seminary, which is a terrible thing for a provost to say, <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be seminary, <laughs> but nevertheless, um, and was working full time and just kind of not going anywhere. So Geisler gave me the best ex advice I could have had at the time. And he understood then what I, came to understand later that not 
not everything in apologetics is philosophical, whatever that means, but a lot of it is. So what he encouraged me to do was just basically interrupt seminary, go back to the university and study philosophy. He, he understood for me that would have been the best training to be able to do Christian apologetics that I could have gotten at the time. Again, today he gives different advice, Southern Evangelical Seminary, premier apologetics seminary in the country, those kind of things. And there are other choices of some good schools out there. But then the, the, the way to go, if you were going to do a lot of what I was interested in doing, was to go philosophy. So I ended up going back to uh, my home state and went to the University of Mississippi, uh, did a master's in philosophy. And then later, uh, having studied a little bit at Marquette before I ended up at Arkansas and did my PhD in, in philosophy there. Interestingly, my master's thesis was on Bill Craig's Kalam argument. It, it hadn't been out that long in book form. And I wanted to see if I could extend the, the argument to defend it against objections that had come out subsequent to his book. <clears throat> you couldn't possibly anticipate every possible objection. So I took a handful of those to see if I could continue to defend the argument. And then when I did my dissertation at Arkansas, I did it on Aquinas's second way, his famous five arguments for God's existence at the beginning of the Summa Theologia. And the second way is his efficient causality. So they're sort of like bookends, yeah. you know, a Kalam kind of argument, and then a, and a uh, more philosophically oriented uh, efficient causality kind of argument for, for the existence of God. And that is what's given me not only my love for apologetics to see what it can do. Uh, you know, we all know what apologetics is designed to do in terms of pre-evangelism, where you're dealing with objections, trying to persuade people for the truth of the Christian faith so they can consider the claims of Christ. But I, I experienced firsthand what apologetics can do for somebody who's already saved, mm. how it can bolster their, their faith, which is what I really needed. And then add on top of that, then, the discipline of philosophy, whatever that is, we can look at, try to understand maybe what we mean by that. The role that it indispensably plays, not only in apologetics, but hopefully, as we'll see, as we explore a little bit, the role that it needs to play in theology. Hence the title of a presentation that I often do. I think you probably heard this when we were together at CIA, uh, How Theology Needs Philosophy which is pretty in your face, I realize okay. it's a title, but nevertheless, it's really what I mean, despite the fact that there are a number of detractors uh, today in the evangelical community who really don't like philosophy. Yeah, that's, it's, it's quite the story you have there. And um, before we do get into all these just great topics on theology and philosophy and apologetics and really the depths of it, I really, I want to define our terms. How do you define philosophy? What is, what do you, how do you give it? What, what is your definition of? Yeah. So it's, it's tough in one respect because it's a, it's such a broad term or broad in the sense that it covers a lot of different things. The common ground of which is not always obvious. So sometimes having done philosophy for a while and read philosophers, then you look back over what you've been doing and go, that's kind of what we mean by philosophy because definitions try to pick out maybe a common theme, and that, that sometimes can be a challenge. Mm -hmm. But one textbook I used when I was at Ole Miss and was teaching undergraduate philosophy courses while I was working on my graduate degree is a, a book titled um, Questions That Matter by Ed Miller, who was at, at the time was at University of Colorado Boulder. And, uh, and he defined it basically this way. Philosophy is thinking rationally and critically about life's most important question. Now, he goes on to unpack rationally, meaning that you don't just, uh, you're not just driven by emotion, right? It can be attended with emotion, but reason, logic, evidence, these kind of standards have to guard and govern the method of inquiry when we're looking at some of these, quote, most important questions. And then critically, meaning that we, we don't want to just be naive and believe everything we hear. We want to reflect upon claims of truth. Uh, is there a God or not? Uh, you know, is, is something objectively morally wrong or right? These kind of questions. We want to reflect on those critically, meaning we bring the, the, the tools of critique. So I like, I like Miller. Now, one thing, though, that the illustration or the definition touches on is that you, you begin to see, well, you know, there are a lot of life's most important questions. And a lot of, in fact, maybe the most important questions, wouldn't we say, 
that theology is really the answer to those, not philosophy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so what I hope we can explore is a um, little bit more about what we mean by philosophy, but also the role that I would argue it has to play even in doing the theology. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll see what some of those are. Again, it sounds self-serving for me to make this argument as a philosopher, but I, I think for the most part uh, throughout Christian history, when Christianity and the ancient Greek thinking collided, those uh, various methods and protocols and data points and things of philosophical thinking and then theological Christian thinking began to flow together. And you see this, this relationship uh, take a lot of different aspects and dimensions throughout the past 2,000 years. Uh, there have been detractors, but there have also been enthusiasts. And in, in our day, even in American Christianity and in evangelicalism, you find detractors and enthusiasts. So I'm an enthusiast for the role of philosophy, but there are others who are out there on a crusade, if you will, to disabuse Christians of the protocols and methods and tools and, and these kind of data points of philosophy. So <clears throat> I try to make the case that you can't you can't dispense with it all together. You can just displace good philosophy with bad, maybe. So you're not really getting rid of a philosophy. Maybe we'll explore some of the specifics as, as we go along. <clears throat> Definitely. And I feel like maybe the last thing we have to get over here before we really get into the issues is there are some, like you said, detractors in the Christian community of philosophy. And interestingly, a lot of them seem to come from the reform movement, which maybe you'll point out is, is actually inconsistent with the movement in its original yes. conception. Um, but people often point out Colossians 2.8, which where Paul says, don't be taken captive by vain and hollow philosophies. How do you deal with that verse? That's a verse I've struggled with. That's a verse I think anybody wanting to do philosophy as a Christian has to deal with. How do you, how, how do you come to grips with that verse? How do you interpret that verse? Yeah, well, you know, right off the bat, one of the things Geiser observed about that, excuse me, is that he would basically say, look, when the verse is telling us beware of of philosophy in vain deceit. Geiser would argue, well, you can't beware of philosophy without being aware mm. of philosophy. So whatever it is, if someone's going to conclude it's part of the problem and it's something to be avoided, we at least have to know what it is so we'll know to avoid it. If somebody said, hey, there's this disease out there that's potentially fatal, so make sure you don't do anything to catch this disease. And that's the last they go. You go, well, so what do I do to catch it? Do I inhale it or do I eat it or do I touch something? I, if people don't tell you, even if it was a, something to be avoided, if they don't tell you enough about what it is exactly I'm supposed to avoid, we're not, we're not going to know what to, to avoid. So even if Paul was sounding that alarm against philosophy, it still tells us there's something there to be, to be known. I mean, C.S. Lewis put it this way. He said, bad, bad philosophy must exist if for no other reason than bad philosophy needs to be answered. Or Aquinas says that because at times the teacher of sacred scripture must oppose the philosophers, he must at times make use of philosophy mm -hmm. to oppose these philosophers. But also think about, uh, I sometimes will challenge a, an audience, what is the context of Colossians 2a? What goes on to be the subject of the balance of that chapter. And I, I found almost nobody could tell you, well, what is he warning the Colossians about? I think a better way to render the Greek there, and I make an argument for this in my presentation, a person can get the slide deck. I can tell you how to do that here in due course. Uh, a better rendering, I think, of the Greek is Paul is saying, beware of the philosophy, which is vain deceit. So I don't think he's indicting philosophy, broadly speaking. First of all, that term wasn't even used the way we use it today as this discipline that we identify as a philosophy major or this is a book on philosophy. It, that term wasn't even used that way. Philosophy and philosophers were basically what we would call today scholars, learned people that had a breadth of knowledge, and they were generally called philosophers. So I think Paul is warning us about a specific philosophy, which was scandalizing, potentially, the, life, the Christian life of the Colossians. And what was that? Well, as you go on to read the rest of the chapter, he starts describing what we identify later as a Gnosticism, what we sometimes may refer to today as a new age. Taste not, touch not, you know, uh, worship of angels. And so this, this insidious kind of legalism was beginning to plague the Colossians. 
And Paul said, look, these kinds of legalistic way of living your Christian life, it has the appearance of piety, but it's of no use against the indulgences of the flesh, because it's something that's not done according to the power of the Holy Spirit as a Christian grows in Christ. It's just all this, this legalism. That's the philosophy that he was warning about. Now, that doesn't by itself prove then, okay, well, the philosophy gets a pass. Uh, it just means that if, there, if anyone wants to leverage an argument biblically against the discipline of philosophy, I don't think Colossians 2.8 is going to serve them at all if one considers what the verse is actually talking about in context. Mm. And I think, too, a lot of people, especially those who aren't familiar with the discipline, when they look at philosophy, they see a lot of, especially our modern philosophers, they see a lot of secularism. They see a lot of skeptical atheism in philosophy. They see David Hume. Um, they, they see philosophers like him. But how many, I mean, philosophers have for a long time been Christian. There's been so many great Christian philosophers. Off the top of your head, who are some great Christian philosophers and uh, how have they helped the tradition and discipline of philosophy? Yes, absolutely. You know, when Christianity and Greek thought collided from the very beginning, you see church leaders, what we sometimes refer to as the church fathers, already, uh, some of them coming out of some of this Greek thinking before they became Christians, and they are utilizing a lot of the protocols and methods and tools that comprise philosophical thinking of people like Plato or Aristotle, for example, they're utilizing these things to service the claims of Christianity and defend it. You see that early on. Another thing you notice as you go through Christian history is that the distinction that we now seemingly conveniently make between theology and philosophy wasn't so clear cut uh, early on. Theology and philosophy were very often just done together. The only, maybe the main distinction, if there was one, was that by and large, theology attained a lot of its data from revealed truths, hmm. from special revelation, the apostles and prophets and, and such. Whereas philosophy, if whatever truth it might have, were truths that were thought to be able to believe, be, be known by reason, by demonstrative arguments and stuff. So these things flow together. So very early on, you, you begin to see people like Tertullian. Now, Tertullian is often touted as one of the early resistors mm -hmm. of philosophy. And Tertullian uh, was actually very conversant in Greek philosophy and utilized it in his own writings and had his own uh, philosophies that he hated, but had his others that he loved. Well, that's what everybody's doing. So Tertullian, even though it's a famous quote that what does Jerusalem have to do with Athens, that kind of thing, they say, well, see, the early church fathers didn't like philosophy. Said, no, no, they weren't all that way, and even Tertullian wasn't really that way. But you see people like Augustine, for example, another one who came out of Greek thought and became a Christian as an adult and began to utilize his knowledge and primarily in Platonic thought to service his Christian faith. Uh, Geisler used to tell us as students that Aquinas gets his philosophy from Aristotle, but he gets his theology from Augustine. And of course, his, his theology is also mixed with, a lot with philosophy. So you've got people like Augustine. In between Augustine until the Middle Ages, there are some whose names might not be quite as familiar. People like Pseudo Dionysius, who was also a big influence on Aquinas. But in my judgment, the sort of zenith of uh, philosophical thinking was uh, Thomas Aquinas uh, in the 13th century. So what's interesting, uh, Brayden, is that you've got the, probably the two biggest Greek thinkers in terms of their subsequent influence on Western civilization were Plato and Aristotle. Uh, but each of those have their sort of Christianized version. Mm -hmm. So Augustine more or less baptized and sanctified Platonism for Christianity. And Aquinas more or less baptized and sanctified Aristotle for Christianity. So between the four of them, Plato, Aristotle, Augustine, and Aquinas, you've got a large chunk of a lot of Christian theological and philosophical thinking that have really forged large measure what we identify as Western civilization. And, uh, and so you know, Ken Samples has a great book on, on great thinkers, about seven or eight great thinkers. People like Anselm would be another luminary whose name bears mentioning. 
And then we've got contemporary thinkers like a C.S. Lewis, for example. Uh, and so, so uh, I forget the title exactly, Ken, but you should be able to identify it pretty easily where he does the very thing. Hey, what are some of the, who are some of these biggies that really warrant a little bit of investigation to enrich our own Christian uh, thinking? And I think that you, could, you can't go you can't go wrong with Augustine and Aquinas. Oh, I don't not. agree with everything they say, but I don't agree with everything I say, so we're even. <laughs> so. Right. And there are really some, on the recent stage, there's been some great Christian philosophers um, like Alvin Plantinga and William Lane Craig, uh, Richard Swinburne at Oxford. You've got, you've got a lot of them really now in our mind. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, these guys really helped me a lot as a young philosophy student because uh, before some of these guys came on the scene, like a Swinburne or a Plantinga, I think by and large in academics, Christianity was considered sort of naive and, and relatively unsophisticated. And there was a period in early 20th century where it was, it was almost vilified by Anglo-American philosophy as just being anti-philosophical. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why the famous uh, Time magazine cover that we've all seen, I actually have the, that cover out of the 60s, uh, is God dead? And you see that picture in a lot of apologetic literature. What a lot of people don't realize is just a few short years after that, Time Magazine came out with another article that warranted a cover. And that cover says, is God coming back to life? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, in other words, they start going, whoa, 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 wait a minute. There are actually some really formidable philosophical thinkers who are embracing uh, philosophy and Christianity together. And you mentioned people like like uh, uh, Richard Swinburne, for example. Uh, Alvin Plantinga, probably one of the most respected, whether you agree with him or not, uh, philosophers out there. Um, you know, he, when I was a graduate student in Ole Miss, I won't bore you with the stories, but I have a lot of these, what I call brushes with greatness uh -huh. stories that I bore my students with. And one of which was that Plantinga came to Ole Miss for our annual philosophy uh, association meeting in the state as a keynote speaker. And just to kind of tag along with him and the faculty when we go out to eat lunch and such, you know, these guys were just titans yeah. in, in my mind. I didn't understand most of what they were saying, but uh, and, and, and in a sense, and I'm not trying to trivialize where I might agree or disagree with some of these guys, but ending those debates, there's something to be said about uh, the role these men are, and women are playing in, in um, reinforcing in the minds of students the, the, the viability of Christian thinking. You think of people like uh, Marilyn McCord Adams, who was at UCLA, uh, or, or uh, Linda Zabzewski, who was president of the Society of Christian Philosophers at the University of Oklahoma. I think a lot of Christians would be surprised how many state universities have Christians. My department chairman, when I was at Ole Miss, I mean, at um, University of Arkansas, Tom Senor, a consummate philosopher, Christian man, wonderful thinker and such. Yeah, uh, again, we don't all agree on some of the stuff and the debate can get rigorous and I like that debate, but it's still something to be said that these people are uh, professing Christians. They may not all be evangelicals, they may not all believe in the inerrancy of the Bible, but there's still a lot to be said about the fact that they are uh, thoroughgoing, bona fide philosophers and committed Christians at the same time. Yeah, it's, and it's encouraging as, as a young person who loves the discipline, I think for lots of young people to see these great uh, kind of titans of our modern day, just going up there with everybody else, secular and non-secular alike. And Absolutely. I know this is, now I kind of wanted to get into, I know this is what you really want to get, one of your exciting things, one of your uh, presentations you do, how theology needs philosophy. So let's, let's get into that. How does theology need philosophy, specifically as it comes to our humanetics, our interpretation of scripture? How does philosophy help us and how does philosophy aid us? Yes. So one of the things I, I like to start with is draw a, a parallel by way of illustration to another discipline, just to sort of make sure we have sort of clearness in our mind, the clarity in our mind about the boundaries about which we are, I'm trying to defend when I say theology needs philosophy. Uh, it's, it, it, during the uh, 16th century, 17th century, there was a span of time back where the church but also the scholars pretty much believe that the sun moved across the sky and the earth was still. This is a model that comes out of Aristotle, uh, was championed by Ptolemy, and it dominated Western thought, in fact, maybe most thought around the world. 
Uh, but when Copernicus began to challenge us, and then even more so Galileo began to challenge and said, no, really, the sun is actually still rel relative to the earth, and it's the earth that's moving. And that was, again, a painful kind of paradigm shift that took several centuries to actually engage. One of the arguments that Cardinal uh, Bellarmine made against Galileo uh, was this, that, Gal uh, that uh, Joshua chapter 10 says that Joshua commanded the sun to stand still. And Bellarmine said, well, look, you can't command something to stand still if it's not moving. So clearly the Bible is teaching that the sun is moving, not the earth. Um, well, eventually, for reasons that we don't necessarily need to explore, unless you're curious about it, the, the, the shift occurred. The scientists and, and the theologians began to say, you know what, it looks like the sun actually is standing still relative to the earth, and it's the earth that's moving. So what do we do with the Joshua passage? Well, we made a move in hermeneutics that was already a typical move we've made in other verses, namely what is called phenomenological language or language of appearance. In other words, the sun appears to move. In fact, we still talk about the sunrise. Even the scientists today say sunrise tomorrow will be at 7 p.m., I mean, 7 a.m., you know, they don't, they literally don't think it rises, but they, they use that language of a, of appearance, right? And it's, it's not unlike the way we deal with Joel chapter two, when the Joel says that the moon would turn to blood. Well, nobody even then believed that the moon actually became liquid, right. you know, with corpuscles and plasma and, and these kind of things. No, well, why does it say the moon turned to blood? Because it became red like blood is. It had the appearance of blood. So all we had to do is go, we, I think now this Joshua 10 passage is phenomenological, not literal. All right, so that's all, that's all fine. But notice the lesson, several lessons to draw. One, the discipline of astronomy enabled us to correct a misunderstanding of a certain verse of scripture. Now, if, if the discipline of astronomy can do that as a matter of principle, might it be possible that the discipline of philosophy, whatever that is, might it be possible that on occasion it might do that, that it might help us correct a misunderstanding that we have of, of God's nature or of God himself, even in his word. My argument is it not only can do that, it has to do that. Um, now, before I give you uh, an example, if you want, of that, let me just make one more generalized point about philosophy. A person walks outside on a sunny day, and they just make an observation. What a what a bright sunny day it is! No one would go. Well, you must be an astronomer. Like what? Man, you just you just observed how bright the sun is. That that's astronomy. You go. No, that's not astronomy. That's just a normal human observation. <laughs> astronomy is is when you take some just normal human observations and begin to do an in-depth analysis of the sun or of the heavenly bodies and things like that. And that discipline, this in-depth analysis, that's called astronomy, not just the normal observation of things like a bright sunny day, right? So I think there's a parallel to that to philosophy. Philosophy begins with just normal human experiences. I noticed that the little puppy dog that my friend had a few years ago is now a huge great name. I don't believe that he just exchanged a slightly larger dog uh, day after day. I believe there's something common all, throughout all its changes. This observation is just a normal human experience. But if you begin to do an in-depth analysis, well, exactly what is it about a thing like a dog, according to which it stays the same throughout all of its changes? And exactly what is it about a thing like a dog that is the grounding or basis upon which it has these changes? And, and what can we say about those aspects of this dog? That then is the beginnings of what uh, philosophy is, in, in this case, metaphysics. So uh, I don't mean just any kind of normal human observation is just de facto doing philosophy, but philosophy is the name we give to this sufficiently rich exploration of what starts out to be normal human experiences. So when it comes to then understanding our Bible, I would, I would submit to you that there are things in the Bible that if a person uh, at least didn't allow for the fact that philosophy can be a corrective, 
a person could get into heresies about how they understand your Bible. Uh, one extreme example I give is the Dake Annotated Reference Bible. And Dake believed that God had all these body parts, legs and lips and hair and tongue and eyes and arm. Now, their spirit body parts, whatever that means, but he thought that God moved around. Well, indeed, the Bible actually says in 2 Samuel chapter 7, when God is saying, hey, you know, why don't you build me a house? Because I've been moving around in the wilderness all these years. I've been moving from place to place. And, and I, I challenge people to go, I thought God was omnipresent. How could he move around? But it explicitly says he moves around and moved around in wilderness wanderings. Or the Genesis, Genesis 3 where it talks about God walking in the garden. And I asked a friend of mine, I said, you believe God has legs? I said, no, I don't believe God has legs. Well, it says he's walking. You can't walk without legs. Snakes don't walk. Because he, he's walking out. Why don't, why don't you believe God has legs? And my friend said, well, because John 4 says God is a spirit. I said, so what do you do with the uh, Genesis 3 passage? He said, I take it as a figure of speech. My question was, well, how do you know the John 4 passage isn't the figure of speech? Without argument, he just assumed that when Jesus said God is spirit, that that was literally true. And that when Genesis said, said God that walked, that was just metaphorically true. But how do you know he wasn't literally walking and he's only metaphorically a spirit? And my point is, you can't, you can't always settle the dispute from within the text. Mm -hmm. It isn't, well, if it's poetry, the text is going to mean, it's not going to work. Because Genesis 3 is not poetry, it's historical narrative. Second Samuel 7 is not poetry, it's historical narrative. Right there, you've got God moving around and walking around. Mm -hmm. So some kind of uh, boundary has to, has to uh, come into play. Let me give you one other example, if I may. I'm talking too long, so you just cut me off when you're ready. But the Dake study Bible example, you figure, okay, Dake, you know, he's a quacky, heretic. Who even knows this guy? You know, he, what kind of influence is that? Okay, take at the other end of the spectrum something that I think is just as heretical, potentially, but much more subtle. And that's Gregory Boyd's argument for the fact that God cannot know the future acts of free creatures, what philosophers call future contingent proposition. In other words, Boyd would say, God cannot know what you and I are going to freely choose to eat for lunch tomorrow, all right? Now, he could make you choose whatever he wants you to choose. He's omnipotent in that regard, but he can't know a free uh, action of, in the future. And so what's Boyd's argument? Well, one of the arguments he gives is when Abraham is offering up Isaac as a sacrifice. And he takes Isaac up, binds him, puts him on the altar, and he's about to plunge the knife to kill him. And then the angel stops him, and God says, now I know. And Boyd says, see, God didn't know whether Abraham was really willing to go through sacrificing Isaac, knowing that God had promised it was through Isaac that his descendants would, would be to fulfill this promise. So you figure humanly, well, if I kill him, I've just thwarted God's plan. Of course, Hebrew tells us, Abraham was so convinced that God was going to keep the promise. He figured, I'll kill Isaac and he'll raise him from the dead and we'll go on with the business. <laughs> but the point, point being for a boy um, that he, God didn't know. And so he says, the only reason why people will come to that verse and not conclude the obvious that God did not know what Abraham would have done is because they're bringing, into the, bringing to the text a prior notion of what they think God must be like. And I go, guilty, guilty as charged. <clears throat> Why? Here's the, here's the bottom line, as I see it, uh, Braden. That, that uh, um, when, when you look at um, Isaiah 55 as an example, Isaiah says, the trees will clap their hands. Now, you and I read that, we know it's obviously poetry. The reason, however, that we know it's poetry is because we can know the, enough about the nature of a tree to know that when someone ascribes hands to it, they can't be speaking, speaking literally. <laughs> they know what the word tree means. But how do we know what the nature of a tree is? Well, I would assert that because of our experience of individual trees as we grow up, willow tree, pine tree, an oak tree, a maple tree, whatever, that the, your intellect is able to grasp conceptually this common thing, what the, what the philosophers call a universal tree. And so we know if somebody just said, hey, I've got a tree in my backyard, you know exactly what they mean. Didn't say anything particular. 
didn't say whether it was tall or short, or sick or well, fruit bearing, flower bearing, whatever. It just said tree and you knew what I meant. And we know then that trees don't literally have hands. Well, my contention is as a philosopher that it's the same in principle with things like the nature of God, that there must be some way to know enough about the nature of God to know that when the Bible says he's walking in the garden or doesn't know uh, the future or he's moving around in the wilderness, that these can't be literally true. But how do I know these things? Well, I think Paul gives us an insight in Romans chapter 1, verse 20. It says the invisibles, uh, translated often in English, the invisible attributes, the invisible things, the invisibles of God are clearly seen being understood through the things that are made. So as a matter of principle, I think the way God has created the world that we can see here, taste, touch, or smell, we can from that demonstrate the existence of God with all of these superlative attributes of all-knowing, all-powerful, all-good, all-wise. Now, what does that look like? Best case scenario, what it looks like is a person walking outside on a starry night the heavens declare the glory of God and from the shows his handiwork. Who doesn't, who doesn't see that in best case scenario? Or Psalm 97, the heavens declare his righteousness. Or Romans 2, 14 and 15, the works of the law are written on the heart. Or Acts 17, or Acts 14, 17, God's providential superintendence of the history of the human race that speaks of God's providential care and love uh, of us as human beings uh, on the planet. And other verses that we could garner. Uh, that would best case scenario go, obviously, you just look at the creation. Who doesn't know there's a God? But because of the fall, and then more specifically, because of the flowing in of toxic voices, largely philosophical voices over the course of history, that it's begun to muddy the waters. And, and you can have a Richard Dawkins, a consummate scientist, stare right into the complexities of the biological world and can't even see uh, the God who created that biological world. Or you've got Victor Stinger, who's a consummate astronomer, who looks at that starry sky and just go, what? I don't, I don't see any God. The fine tune is there. Now, again, this is self-serving for me to say, but I think part of the problem with a Dawkins or a Stinger or others we could name is that they have been uh, scandalized by bad philosophical thinking. And so part of the task of the apologist who is a philosopher is to try to, you know, try to show that where their thinking collapses, their positivism or their materialism or whatever it is that's you know, scandalous. Self-serving, admittedly, but it's a place at the table I think the philosopher has to occupy. And indeed, many have done that, that we celebrate people like a William Lane Craig or Swinburne or an Alvin Plantinga and these, these kind of guys who have gone before, and, and women as well, Marilyn Adams, uh, Linda Zabzewski, and, and others. Mm, interesting, very interesting. And maybe another, because I know this is big to you as you are, Thomas, you, you follow the philosophy and theology, Thomas Aquinas. Uh, that's kind of the staple, actually, of the uh, Southern Evangelical Seminary. Um, yes. One of the great Thomistic institutes. But I do kind of want to ask you about God's attributes, because Thomas Aquinas had a very interesting way of looking at all these things, and maybe explain your classical theism a little bit, as opposed to our more uh, modern conception of God's attributes. Yes. So uh, it's interesting because uh, uh, I think some of us could will recognize that some of the biggest pushback on classical theism and the role that philosophy might play are coming from a number of our reform brothers and sisters, particularly in America, people like a John MacArthur or James White or Jeffrey Johnson. I'm actually, God willing, to be doing a paper uh, later this year. This is 2022 and we're in June. Um, uh, but by November, God willing, will be given a paper in response to Jeffrey Johnson's attack on Aquinas, mm. saving natural theology from Thomas Aquinas, his, his, uh, one of his books that he's written. But interestingly, <clears throat> some of the biggest defenders of this classical theism and the world philosophy plays in establishing it are also from within these reform ranks. You think of people like James Dolezal, or Richard Muller, J.B. Fesco, uh, uh, Travis Campbell, uh, visiting scholar with reasons to believe. 
uh, or some people that come immediately to mind who are credentialed in terms of their reform. Some of them may be Presbyterian, like Travis. Some are maybe Reformed Baptists, like Sproul, James. Maybe. What's that? R.C. Sproul. R.C. Sproul, of course. How could I, how could I have left him out? Um, in fact, he stood out like a sore thumb all the more in his day because he and John Gerstner were the only two, and no one had ever heard of John Gerstner, who were, who were talking this way because it was so counter to the prevailing influence of Van Til from Westminster Seminary. Sproul didn't go to Westminster Seminary. He went to Pittsburgh and studied under Gerstner. So he's he sort of connected more back to the Princetonians than uh, than than uh, Van Til would have would, would have allowed his disciples to be. That's a different that's a different di different issue. So here's one way in which I contrast classical theism and uh, what uh, Brian Davis referred to as theistic personalism. Um, in fairness to people who are theistic personalists, they don't call themselves that. But if you look through history, a lot of people's monikers are given to them by their detractors. Baptists were called Baptists by people who weren't Baptists. Okay? Methodists were called Methodists by people who weren't Methodists. All right, so that's just kind of the name of the game. I don't mean to be insulting by calling it theistic personalism, whatever, whatever term they want to use. In fact, some of them may even claim to be classical as well in some, in some respect. Here's how I understand the difference. This is oversimplified, but it helps me wrap my mind around. This sort of theistic personalism is a is very largely a per <coughs> excuse me a perfect being theology. The idea is this again. This is just oversimplified. That you get this idea on the basis of analytic philosophy. You define the word perfect. What is what are perfect making qualities? And a being that is perfect would have whatever perfect making qualities are qualities that make a being perfect, whatever those end up being. They end up being things like omniscience, let's say, or, or all loving, or all powerful. So some of them track some of the, perhaps the traditional classical attributes of God, right? But you define the word perfect, and then since God by definition is perfect, the argument goes, then whatever properties obtain to a that are perfect making, those properties must be true of God. Well, that that works fine for some attributes, but there are other attributes that are typically classical historically that don't survive this sieve. They don't survive it because they go, well, you know, I'm not so sure immutability is perfect making. <clears throat> I mean, as a human being, to be immutable would be a paralysis. You'd be paralyzed. You would, that's not a virtue. That's a liability. Uh, I'm not so sure some of them would say that simplicity is perfect making or impassibility. That God is incapable of being affected by his creation causally. That sounds terrible. I thought me, I thought I pray and, and God would hear my prayers and he would move on the basis of my prayer. Now you're telling me it has no effect on God whatsoever. This doesn't sound like the God of Christianity. So, so some of these attributes begin to just sort of fall away because they're not perfect making. Now contrast that sort of the other direction. The classical model doesn't try to define the word perfect. Rather, what this classical tradition, primarily this Aristotelian Thomistic, would approach the, the issue this way. Let's start our philosophical reflection with what we see here taste Hutcher Smith just normal human experience of the sensible world. Aquinas says, all knowledge begins in the senses, it's completed in the intellect. A philosophical reflection will begin to show that given what we experience of the contingent sensible world, there must be a first cause. And this first cause must have all of these attributes. And we recognize that first cause as God. So in other words, we don't define perfect making and then since God is perfect, we assign those qualities to him. And whichever ones don't survive, we don't really care whether God is simple or impassable or whatever. The classical is the going the other direction. It's saying we can know from sound philosophical reasoning what the nature of the first cause, the creator, what his nature must be by, we can demonstrate it by sound reason. That's the argument at least. And so I, Going back to my uh, guilty plea before Gregory Boyd, oh, you're coming to the text with a preconceived notion of what you think God must be like. I go, absolutely. Just like I came to Isaiah with a 
a prior notion of what a tree must be like. But where did I get my notion of tree? From reality. The Bible doesn't tell you that trees don't have hands. Reality tells me that because I can see a tree. In principle, then, there are things about the Bible or things in the Bible that describe God poetically, metaphorically, and properly. In order to judge which one's which, there must be some way in which I can know enough about the nature of God to know when it's speaking one way or the other. And I think that's what this classical Aristotelian Thomistic uh, tradition does uh, with a plum. I mean, it's just the best at it. Now, obviously, people disagree uh, with this. You know, you made a reference, and I appreciate the reference to SES, Southern Evangelical Seminary, and, and we are just top heavy and Thomistic philosophy. Uh, but I, I have to let your, your viewers know, if they don't know already, that uh, the reason why evangelicals recoil and break out in a rash when a fellow evangelical starts talking Thomistic philosophy is because today, in 21st century America, almost always any Christian who speaks in philosophical categories of Aquinas is Catholic Christian, yeah. not Protestant. Mm -hmm. So understandably, evangelical goes, but that sounds like Catholicism. This is James White's big criticism. A Catholic, he's, he's the consummate Catholic theologian. Well, first of all, everybody was Catholic if you weren't Muslim, you know, in the 13th century, or whatever that means. But the Trinity, we don't, we don't accuse ourselves as Protestants of being Catholics because we hold to the Trinity or the two natures of Christ. So just because something is held by Catholics doesn't in and of itself mean it's false. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to have uh, arguments for or whatever. But what I would suggest to your viewers to consider is that this, this scholasticism, this classical realism, this Thomistic realism goes by a lot of names, endured in Protestant thinking well beyond the Protestant Reformation. You read some of the Puritans like John, uh, uh, John Owens or, um, or John Owen, uh, Francis Puritan, probably the single biggest influence on American Reform Presbyterianism in his three volume set, or Stephen Charnock, some of these luminaries in the 17th century who were, and even for that matter, James Arminius, uh, just to throw in the other end of the soteriological spectrum there. These guys were so steeped in the scholasticism. Now, my argument is that, well, Charnock believed it, and so did uh, John Owen, and so did Francis Turretin. My argument is, therefore, it must be true. I'm just deflecting a, a, a weaker criticism, namely, well, that's just Catholics. Like, no, this had nothing to do with the Protestant Reformation. The reason this stuff began to wane in Protestantism had nothing to do with Protestantism's re rejection of Catholic theology at certain points. It had to do with the added influence of bad philosophical thinking in Protestantism that, I don't want to oversimplify, but by and large, Catholicism was relatively immune to some of those bad influences by decree. I mean, when you get to the, the uh, Fourth Lateran Council, there were certain specifics of Aquinas' philosophical theology that were required as dogma uh, by by, uh, by ecclesiastical authority. So they didn't have the choice to whether they believed in simplicity. Right, like the Protestants did, we didn't have that kind of magisterium. Well, okay, that's all fine and good, except sometimes you got to be extra vigilant, cling to these better ideas and these true ideas, uh, not because the magisterium tells you you have to, but because sound reason tells you that you ought to. It, yeah, it is interesting, um, um, because I actually probably do hold more to uh, a perfect being type of theology. Uh, just personally, and I, 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 but it is, maybe we'll have a, maybe we'll have to have you back on and we'll have a discussion just purely sure. on classical theism, but it is such a different approach, like you were saying, um, because you kind of, you, it, it's just working differently because like you said, uh, people who are more so perfect being theolog theologians start with what is perfection and then add it to God, whereas you more so start with God and then kind of deduce the properties from there. It's, it is a very interesting distinction that you make. I, I, mm -hmm. I find it quite interesting. Yeah, yeah, and, I, and, 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 and to sort of round it out, I, I, the classical tradition would start with the sensible world and argue what the nature of the first cause must be and then identify that first cause as God and then define perfection in light of God, not define God in light of perfection. Right. All right. Now, that sounds unfair for me to characterize it that way as if William Lane Craig didn't know any better than the pick out some arbitrary definition and, and just say God must be like, I mean, it's a whole lot more sophisticated right. than, than, than I'm uh, making it sound like there. But I still disagree with it. You know, another characteristic too of this classical tradition 
uh, as a tradition is uh, I like to contrast the concept of engineering and the expression reverse engineering, mm. right? So uh, an engineer would be a person, let's say he's going to build a bridge across this crevasse. So he has to study the nature of the problem, the materials necessary, the amount of those materials, the application of those materials to eventually solve the problem. What's the problem? Getting across this crevasse with a bridge. That's the problem that the engineer comes to it to solve. That's fine. Now, reverse engineering came into use as a term with the onset of the computer age and the computer chip because the, the legal constraints wouldn't allow a company to take somebody, other company's computer chip and just break it down and go, how does that thing work? And then let's start making our own. That's illegal. That's copyright violation. So what did they do? They, they said, okay, let's, let's, we're not going to pay any attention to how, how they did what they did. Let's look at what they did and see if we can just begin to uh, imagine how to accomplish that by sort of reversing so here's the illustration that I'm trying to get at. The, re the reverse engineer starts with the solution mm -hmm. and tries to work backwards as to how did that solution come about. Whereas the engineer starts with the problem and tries to solve the problem. Now let's apply this to philosophical. Take things like human knowledge. What is knowledge? Well, in, in, the, in the classical tradition, Aristotle, you, you just began with human beings knowing the sensible world, right? You just, how do you know there's a tree? You got to see the tree. I mean, it didn't occur to him to think, well, maybe there's not a tree. It might have occurred to some other Greek, but it didn't really occur to Aristotle. It's like, no, I know there's a tree there. I don't have to be a philosopher to know the sun is shining, it's raining or whatever. Uh, th these are just my normal human experience. But as a philosopher, I want to go, how, what is it that's going on in me that allows me to know that I know that there's this tree. Not whether I know there's a tree, but how it is that I already knew the tree before I even started doing philosophy. Whereas the uh, analytic tradition seems to come at it from the other direction to go, we've got to define what are the necessary and sufficient conditions of knowledge, let's say, for example. Is there a such thing as knowledge? Well, let's define knowledge. Well, what's knowledge? Well, it's true justified belief. Well, how do you know when a belief is justified? And you get all your Gettier problem discussion going on. And, and what does it mean to correspond? And, and it's all this, not useless, but it's all this technical analyses. That supposedly, the, the cumulative effect is you come to think that you know something. Whereas the classical does, eh, that's kind of the other way around for me. You know, they, Jason Lyle's another one of these contemporary critics of philosophy, kind of in the presuppositional ilk. And he challenged me once in a debate. Uh, well, how does Hal know he's not in the matrix? And we all know this matrix metaphor. It goes back uh, a long way before the, for the movie. Mm -hmm. And I won't bore anybody with my answer to that. I can direct you to my blog on my website if you don't mind me shamelessly plugging richardghow.com. <laughs> okay, there you go. Uh, richardghow.com, a pretty cheesy kind of static website, but I think most of the links are working uh, there. And you can just click on the tab on the blog it's the quickest way to get there. And I have uh, the, probably the first article that I show up titled, How Do I Know That I Know? And I'm trying to show that the, the very question is uh, anti-philosophical, not philosophical. If you think that's a question that somehow has to be answered before I can comfortably think I know anything, in my humble opinion, you've got problems that are deeper than what philosophy can solve. You have a human problem. Uh, not a philosophical problem. Now, that deserves to be unpacked. I'm not going to take the time to do that. But it's, it's all to say this classical tradition, I think, is more consonant with normal human experience, layered on top of which becomes this robust philosophical exploration mm. that has given us this classical tradition, which, by the way, I will say provocatively, it alone, in my humble opinion, is what undergirds the superlative attributes of God. I do a presentation titled God Fading Away, where I try to document from the church fathers to yesterday how these classical attributes of God are fading away, even in evangelicalism. So that you have the Gregory Boys of the world that believe God doesn't know the future uh, or can't know the future of free contingent 
uh, propositions and these kind of things. How did, how did we get that? Clark Pinnock, the last book that he wrote before he passed away, was flirting with the idea. He was another open theist. He was flirting with the idea maybe God has a corporeal body, a physical body. You go, how, that sounds like Mormonism to me. How could, how could contemporary evangelical scholars even entertain such radically heretical notions mm -hmm. without even seemingly flinching? Something has happened to get us to this point. Mm -hmm. And I think it is, among other things, the influence of bad philosophy and displacement of sound classical philosophy. I know that's very partisan to say, and I'll have to make that case at some point, but nevertheless, that's, that's where I stand. I can do or no other. I, I, I like it. I like the provocative statements. Maybe we'll have you on and we'll do a conversation on a classical theism and perfect being theology. That'd be, that'd be fun. Absolutely. I'd love that. You, you kind of did segue here, and I wanted to talk to you about how uh, philosophy helps us in our apologetics, because we've gone over how philosophy helps in our theology. Um, so just in general, how do you think philosophy helps us in our apologetical arguments? I mean, there's, I mean, apologetics ranges from all types. You have like a modal ontological argument, which is nothing but philosophy. And then you have yes. a Kalam or teleological argument, which is a little bit of cosmology, a little bit of philosophy, a little bit of everything. How does, how does philosophy inform our arguments? How does it make us better apologists? How does so it it's interesting. I remember uh, as a student at Geisler back in the 80s, and he used to have this talk that he did on college campuses. And I think the title of it was something uh, like 10 points that prove Christianity. And so he, tell, he told us the story that he was on a college campus and he gave his talk. And afterwards he's standing around and students are coming up asking questions. And this co-ed came up to him and said, well, that's all interesting, but that's your truth. That's not my truth. And it was his first encounter with what we later identified as this sort of relativism about truth. Some people would call it postmodern, and it is in some respect a, a version of postmodern kind of thinking. That truth was not something objective. And we had already been contending with moral relativism in the 20th century, Christian, with, with Skinner or uh, Fletcher, or whom some of these uh, names escape me of these that are greater or lesser extent relativist with respect to morality. Um, but relativism with respect to truth was really an odd bird at that level of the college co-ed. You know, maybe the intellectuals, the Foucaults or the Derrida's, they're trafficking in these heavy duty, but, but not your rank and file student. And so it, it, again, then it challenged guys to realize, okay, now we've got to, we, we can no longer just get away with Hey, Christianity is true, and here's my argument for it. Now we've got to back up and antecedently defend what we even mean when we say that it's true uh, in the first place. And so that right there, then, is a philosophical question. I mean, it just is a philosophical question. I, I was at a debate at Georgia State University on the existence of God, and I kept making this point about X, Y, and Z, and that's a philosophical question. That's not a scientific question. And during the Q&A, this gentleman came up, and he said, well, who are you to say that it's a philosophical question? And I was sort of taken aback by that. And, and, I, and I thought, well, it's, it's sort of like if somebody came up to you and we're talking about various plants. Well, is that, is that plant toxic to the touch? Does this one uh, produce edible berries? Does this one survive the winter in this part of the state? And you go, well, those are all botanical questions. What sense would it make for somebody to go, well, who are you to say this is a botanical question? Like, well, no, it's not like we're sitting around going, okay, uh, what questions do we want to give the botanists? What do, what do we want them to deal with? How about plants? Yeah, that sounds good. But you got, oh, yeah, that'd be good. We'll do. No, that's not what happened. It's the other way around. The people that study plants, we give them the name botanist. Not we pick out the subject botany and then look around for somebody to give it to, and then we give it to them and call well, I think it's similar philosophically speaking. It's not like we're saying, well, what do we want the philosophers to do? Well, how about this? And we pick out a certain collection of kinds of questions to say, let's give it to those guys and let them deal with it. No, it's the other way around. These kinds of questions about the nature of knowledge, the nature of truth, the nature of morality, uh, uh, the nature of reality itself, those kind of questions historically are just questions that were being dealt with 
just as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. to which the name philosophy was eventually attached. All right. So, you know, I, I tell audiences sometimes, especially uh, if it's an evangelical audience, and I'm trying to lobby for my place at the table as a philosopher. I say, do you believe the Bible is inerrant? Oh, of course we believe the Bible is inerrant. I say, well, but you can't know what an error is if you don't know what truth is. You wouldn't know what the Bible, you wouldn't know the Bible is inerrant if you didn't know what an error is, right? Mm -hmm. But you can't know what an error is if you don't know what truth is. But what truth is, is a philosophical question. The Bible doesn't tell you what truth is in the sense in which we're talking about it as philosophers. The Bible doesn't say, hey, the best way to interpret your Bible is the historical grammatical method. Well, it doesn't, the Bible doesn't tell you that that's the method, but that we somehow think that is the method is even though, where do we get that? And I think point after point after point, where you get that ultimately is it's something fundamentally true about the nature of reality. Mm. Now, again, just observing that certain things are real and true just in terms of normal human experience, that's not philosophy, but taking those things and doing a deliberate in-depth analysis of it then begins to take on the contours of what we identify as philosophy. So are we interested as apologists in demonstrating the truth of Christianity? Yes. But in some quarters, we can no longer take it for granted that people are even going to know what we mean when we say that it's true. We have to be prepared to contend for truth and objectivity of truth. Same thing with good. In fact, I think it's even worse in a sense with good. Notice, in, 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 and I'll challenge your, your viewer, notice how often in discussions about objective morality, notice whether anybody ever during the conversation ever defines the word good and could distinguish if there is any distinction to be made between good and moral good. And in my judgment, and listen until that is adequately explored, the euthyphro dilemma is impossible to answer and the moral argument for God's existence doesn't, doesn't ultimately push the ar argument, in my humble opinion, across the finish line. Mm. But not to mention the problem of evil. I think mean, all of these are impacted precisely because the concept of good and the distinctions to be drawn between good and moral good are, are not robustly explored, uh, but those are philosophical questions. Yeah. Now, maybe in some contexts they don't need to be explored because your audience already, you know, you don't want to fix something that isn't broken, right? You don't want to talk somebody out of believing the truth just so you can turn around and give your really cool philosophical argument. For, you know, it's not that, but we have to be prepared in the marketplace of these, these, uh, these hot button points of objectivity of truth, the nature of truth, the nature of the good, and these kind of things, and the nature of human knowledge, and the role that uh, the, the, the uh, human uh, knowledge plays in knowing these truths. We have to be prepared to talk about them to some extent, and very often direct people to sources mm. when they are curious about, well, who would be somebody good to read to explore this particular angle? Now, uh, because you, you brought up the definition of good, and I remember actually at the last cross, the cross exam of Stokes Academy that I went to where you were there, um, they had us do the Q&A segment where you guys asked us the questions and we had to answer. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And one of the people went up to ask, to, and he, and, uh, he they, you're like, oh, what's your presentation of the moral argument? And you asked him, what is good? And I remember he kind of looked dumbfounded, but I felt for him because I would have been dumbfounded myself really it's not something we think of too often the definition of a term like good is just something we use in our everyday speech we kind of take for granted so yes i do actually kind of want to ask you how do you define good specifically moral good how do you define it yes so let, let me give you the straightforward definition which will create more questions than it really seemingly answers but i think that a proper understanding of that category that we call good we ultimately have to see that uh, good and being are the same thing. They're convertible terms. Now, what does that mean? There's a great article on my website, uh, richardghow.com. If you click on resources tab and it gives you some options, go to papers and scroll down. There's an article by a philosopher from the Free University of Amsterdam named uh, Jan Artsen. 
he argues, the title of the article is The Convertibility of Being and Good in Thomas Aquinas. And I would say good, first of all, whatever I mean by well-being and good ultimately are the same. Whatever I mean by that, we'll explore just real shortly. Uh, the cash value of that is, at some point, whatever it is we're saying about something, when we say that it is good or that it is not good, at some point, it has to be that what we're saying hooks up with what is real, right? In other words, if the concept of good or the category never just actually hooks up with, with real, then our, any argument we give is never going to really prove anything, God's existence or anything else. It has to somehow, it has to somehow be the same thing to be real and to be good. So now, what do I mean by something being the good is convertible with uh, the, the, the real? I think it's easy to see when we compare uh, being or existence or real and then the concept true and the concept good. Aquinas would argue that by and large, when we say something is true, true is the name we give to the intellect's grasp of the real. By definition, an intellect is oriented towards the true, right? In other words, you never don't believe something that you don't think is true, mm -hmm. right? There may be things that you believe that in fact aren't actually true, but you thought they were true. Well, what do you mean by true? Well, you ultimately mean what is real, but it's, it's real with respect to an intellect. Mm -hmm. My intellect reaches out for the real, and when it grabs the real, we call that connection true. By parallel, the good is that towards which this is sort of, these are sort of fundamental. You can carry them out a little bit as far as we want in terms of God and all that. I'm just kind of getting it off the launching pad. Good is that is reality with respect to the will. The will, all, by definition, always reaches to grab the real, and we call that good. Now, just as an intellect can grasp something that isn't actually true, yet we, it still apprehends it as true, it's just mistaken, the will always grasps what it apprehends as good. It may not really be good, it might be mistaken, but it is, it is by definition good, meaning it's the object of the, 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 the will. It's, it's reality with respect to uh, the will, all right? That's, that's fundamental. And press a little bit further, I would argue, again, this is just our initial inaugural, what we see here, taste, touch, or smell kind of level. When we say something is good, you think about a good pizza, or a good knife, or a good car, or a good person. The thing that I think is common among all those is that we characterize that thing as good in as much as it, it, it has or, it, or exemplifies all the characteristics that it ought to have by virtue of the kind of thing that it is. So if somebody came along and said, it's not a very good knife. Well, why do you say that? Well, because the blade is pitted and dull and the handle is all broken. Well, it wouldn't make sense for somebody to go, well, who are you to say that a knife ought to have a nice sharp blade? Just go, well, that's just what it is to be a knife. To be a knife is to have these kinds of characteristics by virtue of, the, of its nature. And so I think we use that word always that way. Here's where, though, it gets interesting. Okay, so I understand what a good pizza is. Good pizza is not going to have gravel on it. You know, a good knife is not going to have pits on the blade. You know, a good car is not going to... Uh, lack pistons in the engine or whatever, you know? every one of which is good by virtue of the kind of thing that it is. But Aquinas would argue there's something, and this is actually Aristotle, uh, there's something unique about human beings among all life forms on earth, it's sensible, all the animals on earth. A lion will never fail to exemplify all the attributes of lions unless it's injured or malnourished or diseased or something. In other words, left to its own devices, 
it'll never not be a lion. Mm -hmm. An acorn will never not grow into an oak tree. And every natural object will always tend towards the fulfillment of its nature, its teleology, as it's referred to. Humans, however, according to Aristotle and Aquinas, have a characteristic of ra rationality. That is, we can deliberate among choices and free will. Now, I just have to add, this is free will and more of a, more of a philosophical thing, not, not, not just the free will as the Calvinist and Arminian and Molinist might debate it. It, it. They overlap, but they're not exactly entirely the same, but that's a different issue. Uh, so a human then goes, well, look, it's one thing to think, well, if I'm a zygote, I'm going to grow up to be a full-grown, healthy adult left to my own devices if I'm not injured or malnourished or diseased, right? But there's something else about us that Aristotle identified as the virtues that will not occur naturally in us, but will only occur by very strategic application and employment of our rationality and free will, and those are the virtues. You're not going to grow up and, no, and be a virtuous adult. You have to cultivate your virtues by this strategic application of your choices. And this whole virtue theory tradition was picked up by a lot of Christians. So, you know, a lot of that really dovetails exactly with what we elsewhere knew to be true about good and evil with respect to us as human beings. So here's the last point. I know I'm Taking more, I, I, I'm thinking about starting. Uh, I'm thinking great. about starting a, a podcast called "More Than You Wanted to Know." You know, just so every every video. Goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's. I mean, I just wanted to know how's it going, and you're now 30 minutes later, you're still telling me how it's going. You know, it's more than I wanted to know. This is great. Here, here's the cash value of it all. Um, when an acorn becomes a oak tree fully, what has happened in that that teleology is that all of these potencies it has as an acorn are ultimately made real. They're all actualized into a full grown robust. Same thing with any natural kind, whether it's a plant or an animal. Uh, the being all it can be is actualizing all these potencies. Well, to actualize a potency is to make it real, mm -hmm. is to give it existence. So ultimately, the good of things is the, it's the acquisition of the existence that that thing can fully possess by virtue of its nature. Mm. Well, Aquinas argues, God is existence itself. He is subsistent existence itself. He is infinitely what the finite world is only finitely trying to approximate, what we call sanctification in the Christian life. Right? Uh, so, but God is not trying to be all he can be. He's not being, trying to be the best God he can be. He is metaphysically and ontologically the, the actual infinite reality to which our finite teleologies are signposts, are pointing to, pointing to be good, like he is goodness itself. Now, again, there's more to explore here, but where I think this applies is I think that it, it, it alone ultimately answers the euthyphro dilemma. Is something good because God says it's good, or is it good because, God, because it already is good and God says it? And I think, in my experience, most apologists that I'm, I'm not familiar with, all of them, obviously, but the ones that, that I've heard off and on through my apologetic growth, it never really pushes it across the finish line. I had a friend of mine who wrote a book, and I heard him give a talk on his book, and in, in during his book, he said, uh, well, good is that which is according to God's nature. So we say, God, you know, God does what he does because it's in accordance with his nature. And I asked him, I said, well, if good means in accordance with God's nature, then the statement, God is good, just amounts to the statement, God is according to God's nature. But of course, everything is according to its nature. Satan is according to Satan's nature. Humans are according to human nature. So to say good is just that which is according to God's nature then evacuates the statement God is good of any content. It doesn't tell me anything about God. It just tells me he is his nature. And he sort of is a deer in the headlights like, well, I guess that's why I'm not a philosopher or something like that. Dude, 
you should have got somebody to read your book before you published it. Because right. that seemed to me to be like a fundamental. If you haven't given content to the word good enough that it, it has content, then how do we know whether it does or doesn't apply to God? Mm -hmm. The ultimate answer in my judgment, and that needs to be further unpacked, is that what we mean by good ultimately is what we mean by real, by true. God is ultimate, infinite being. That's why he's ultimately, infinitely good and ultimately, infinitely truth. Artson's article unpacks uh, Aquinas' short little argument on that to try to ferret that out. It still may not be clear exactly what we're saying, but well, that's more than you wanted to know. As I, no, that's, 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 that's fantastic, and that's an excellent explanation. And we could honestly probably just do a whole podcast just on that one topic. It brings, like you said, it opens a whole can of worms because then we have questions about divine command theory and absolutely all sorts of stuff. So I'm actually going to go read the article, hopefully following our discussion. Yes, here. please do. Um, I kind of want to, in closing here, end with some more practical questions uh, for cr Christians really in general. And I guess my first one is philosophy kind of to some seems like a daunting subject to understand. It's very complex. It's very technical in a lot of ways. How can Christians study philosophy? Maybe Christians who haven't even don't really have that much background. How can they get into it? What resources do you recommend? How can they educate themselves on this? Yes. So I teach a class at the seminary titled Classical Philosophy, basically. And it's just introduction, which, by the way, people can audit pennies on the dollar at ses.edu if they want to check out. And it'll be teaching it this October. Mm. And I just try to go A to Z, uh, or probably more like A to O. We don't get through the entire alphabet, probably, in, in one, one course. And so uh, to that end, I think there are several sources that, that come to mind. I like Norm Geisler and uh, Paul Feinberg's uh, Introduction to Philosophy of Christian Perspective. Mm. What they do there is just lay out the topography of basic categories and terms uh, that are that like pegboard that you can then, as you learn more about philosophy, you can begin to hang things in different places in epistemology and metaphysics and philosophy of religion and these kind of things. So, that, so that's a good one. Uh, my partisanship as a Thomist, I would uh, highly recommend Edward Fazer's book titled Aquinas. So there's a series, uh, One World Publishing, I think, did this series called Beginner's Guides. And they're just small little paperback intros to various philosophies and philosophers. And Edward Fazer is probably one of the best contemporary articulators of a lot of the thinking of Aquinas in a lot of different levels. He wrote the Beginner's Guide on, on Aquinas. He also wrote the Beginner's Guide in that series on John Locke, which is very interesting, and also the one on philosophy of mind, which I wish I had when I was a graduate student. I think I would have benefited immensely. So what that does is just give somebody just the cookies on the bottom shelf well, exactly what is it about Aquinas? And really, it's Aristotle through Aquinas. Um, uh, what's going on here? And then one can begin to see the boundaries between what is more commonly found in Anglo-American philosophy departments today of this analytic tradition versus, say, the more classical that you almost always find it uh, confined to Catholic. And even that is going to be only selective. I mean, most of your probably standard Catholic universities in, the, in America are relatively indistinguishable in their philosophy department from any state university. Um, that, I think, is un, unfortunate, but ne nevertheless. So, uh, Fazer's book, uh, Aquinas, would be a good partisan uh, approach from my own perspective as a Thomist, but then more neutral with respect to some of these things, I think, would be um, Norm Geiser and Paul Feinberg's Introduction to Philosophy in Perspective. Now, and this is, I think we've already kind of touched on this a little bit, but how do we discern between good and bad philosophy for, especially for those who are newer to it, they're not super experienced in addition. How do they kind of pick out, well, mm, this isn't quite right, or this is yeah. consistent with my beliefs. How, how do so, you know that the principle is easy, but the practical is tough. But I, I think that um, you want, when, let's say a, a certain contentious issue. You want to try as much as possible within the, the measure of faith God has given a person, the aptitudes or whatever that they have, to, uh, to entertain more than one perspective from representatives of that perspective, right? And actually, you can do two things. One, maybe even more than that. You, you read the primary sources, at least in English translation, whether it's Aristotle or Plato or whatever. There's no substitute for that. But you also want to try to read really good secondary as I mentioned, a phaser 
uh, F-E-S-E-R. It looks like Fesser, but it's pronounced Phaser. He's a good secondary source in the sense that he's trying to explain to the readers Aquinas' thinking in, in on this and that. So good secondary sources are indispensable in trying to wrap one's mind around. But then also, sort of the inverse of that, the critics. So there would be some good uh, secondary sources who would be critical of Aquinas, for example, like say William Lane Craig. Um, and and uh, Bill and I were part of a four member panel on specifically on the doctrine of simplicity. You can see that on my YouTube it, channel. Yeah, I watched that. Yeah, so that was a blast to go to. And, and you know, he's, you know, he's almost second to none in terms of his acumen as a philosopher. I disagree with him on, on his views about Aquinas and his views about, in fact, I'm working on a huge presentation just on simplicity. And, and I had to split it into two. And the second half is just on objections. Mm -hmm. I deal with people like Ryan Mullins, for example, as well as Bill Craig and other detractors, just on this one doctrine, because simplicity is watershed in my judgment terms of its metaphysics and then this subsequent cascade of attributes of God and, and Aquinas. But at any rate, so one would do well to say, well, what, what would somebody as brilliant as Bill Craig, why would he not think Aquinas was right about something? So that kind of resource is, is also invaluable. Mm. And, you know, so, there, you know, however many volleys you can go back and forth, well, what would someone say to Bill's Craig of Aquinas? And what would Bill say to someone who said something, you know, you can just go as many volleys as you have uh, stamina on mm. any given issue. And, and I would encourage people as a practical matter to, to pick up an issue that they're already passionate about, that they already care about. In other words, if you're going to sit down and go, okay, let's talk about the tripartite theory of knowledge and head of your problems. He was like, you know, somebody poked me in the eye with an ice pick. I think that would be more, you know, I don't mean that against the Betty. I'm just saying it might be a subject that a person goes, yeah, I don't even really care that much about. But just forget it. Pick something you care about. Attributes of God, existence of God, or the Euthyphro dilemma, or, um, you know, maybe it is head of your problems and, and, and tripartite theory of knowledge versus a classical theory. Maybe it is that. But if you've already, you're already impassioned about the subject, it's a lot easier to wade through the challenging material because you're already into it. And then you may find my experience has been, you might get exhausted of a certain topic before you feel like you've really explored it adequately. That's fine. Just, okay, you table that. It may cycle around in another whole year and then you pick up. But what you'll notice if you're a student of philosophy is over the course of time, you, your database just gets bigger and bigger and your capacity to really critically interact with who you're reading gets better and better mm -hmm. because you've got more and more background knowledge. So you can't start out at the top. You just start out, like they say, the way to eat an elephant is just one bite at a time. <laughs> Don't just say, well, let's slice, slice it in half and put half of it on a, on a bun. You go, that's not going to work. You know, you just, so that's the same way with philosophy, just little bites at a time. There's probably little substitute too for having people in your life that you can argue with <laughs> and, and be reinforced. You know, mentors, I've had my mentor, my brother, Tom Howe, who is really the brains at the seminary. has been one of my biggest influences in my philosophical growth. And we, we sit around and talk a lot and still do by phone. Uh, but, you know, having these people in your life, I Zoom with a lot of people off and on. Uh, some of my Zooms, I have regular discipleship Zooms with, uh, with people in philosophical issues we've been doing for years. Uh, others are more spontaneous. Hey, can you get together for lunch? You know, so-and-so had a question about X, Y, and Oh, man, let's do it. Mm. It's more fun than Christians should be allowed to have. Right. That's, you know, uh, but you're doing the same thing that I'm doing. Right, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's too much fun to miss out on. And I guess this will be, we've had such a wonderful interview. I guess this will be my last question for you. And it's just I, maybe the most practical one. How do we, how do Christians stay encouraged? I, I mean, I get down sometimes. I'm sure you struggle with it too. In any industry, uh, in any discipline, whether it's the sciences, uh, the histories, literature, people with the biblical worldview are always going to be the minority. And that's, that's yeah. still true in philosophy. How do we stay encouraged, even though we're usually outmatched, we're usually outgun we're, we're trying to just stay alive sometimes how do people stay encouraged in that yeah so I, I think one of the most important things to me 
in terms of practical encouragement is uh, constantly remind oneself, it's not about you. Mm. What this is all about is the glorification of God and the advancement of the kingdom. Now, that sounds Sunday morning preachy to some people, but, but, but what I find very often in my own life is that I'll, I'll start focusing on what am I doing and how relevant is that and am I making any progress or am I spinning my wheels? And then every once in a while, you know, there's just, I know your viewers know this, there's no substitute for spending time with God, whatever worked for you. I walk at night. My neighbors, <laughs> they see me there because I'm pacing around my driveway in front of my house at two o'clock in the morning because I'm a night owl. But I very often, uh, Braden, have to remind myself, it's not about me. It doesn't matter. What matters is, am I being faithful with what God has given me, whatever that looks like? And God can help us understand. It just be faithful with what God's given you. You may not be the next Bill Craig who's going to tour the world and everybody knows your name. But you might be. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether it doesn't matter to Bill Craig that he's the Bill Craig. Right. What matters to him is being faithful with what God has given him. And so that faithfulness may be something that never translates into anything that very many people notice, or it might, but it doesn't matter because it's not about us. It's about us being faithful to glorify God with the tools and methods and opportunities. And, and it's, it's almost eerie in a way how often in my life, when I've sort of gotten off track mentally and I'm so self-absorbed, that I try to reorient and confess my sin and say, Lord, this is not about me. This is about the kingdom of God. That right after that, some opportunity presented itself. Just the very next thing I get a call, hey, would you be willing to do this Zoom interview or radio interview, this internet uh, podcast or whatever? Not every time, but I'm saying, I, I go, yeah, thank you. It's a great opportunity. I love the opportunity. Give me the chance to do that. And uh, it's just helped me be faithful. And so that staying close to the Lord, keep, keep mentors in your life. Keep spiritually minded brothers, if you're, if you're a male, or sisters, if you're a female, in your orbit. Don't, don't especially if you're going to go off and study philosophy and stuff. Geister used to tell us, make sure you're grounded with your mentors, uh, otherwise it'll change you. Uh, and I remember when I left Dallas and came to Old Miss, and I, I remember right where I was in my car driving in my neighborhood when Geiser called me up and he said, uh, so what are you taking this semester? And I said, well, I've got a problems in epistemology and your philosopher viewers will appreciate this. Geiser goes, there are no problems in epistemology. <laughs> and I get the joke, uh, but nevertheless, hey, he's just keeping tabs on me. Right. Making sure I'm staying connected with, with him and others in my life indirectly people like R.C. Sproul through their ministries. Now with the internet, man, there's just more out there to stay connected to than you have time in the day. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and a podcast like yours and the blog that you write and things like that, there's just a lot of great examples out there of Christians who have already been down the road a little ways that can help others that are still not far enough yet or, or on their way, I should say, in this, this growth in and it's just an adventure. Life is an adventure just to be in on what God's doing. He doesn't need us. He can take a rock and make an apology to a philosopher. But he lets us get in on it. Right. So we can experience the joy uh, of, of what he's doing. And it's, I just, I can't believe I get to do the things that I do. Well, I think that's a great note to end on. I think that's uh, definitely given everyone a smile. Such a beautiful ending. Thank you so much for coming on, Dr. I was such a privilege to have you. Thank you so much, Brandon. I appreciate it so much, friend. Well, I'll tell the viewers, I hope you guys really got a lot out of that one. I know I certainly did. Um, you're, you might have some stretch marks on your brain, but it was, it was a super fun interview. So I'll see you guys next time.